Now, I was just. I know who you are now. I was just going to ask Jonathan actually, yeah, sort of what your experience had been in terms of getting developers first-hand experience in the environments where the users have to live and work and confront the limitations of technology. I was kind of curious what you're seeing because we, you know, our, our model has been to, de to peer mentoring of local engineers so they can start working with the technologies, but we're rotating our teams to, to Cambodia for one and two and three month stints. Um, and you know, it's astonishing how they come in and after, you know, a month they have some experience where they've built something in Java or .NET and they spend 11 hours trying to download a two meg .NET update and then they start coding to three-year-old, four-year-old versions of the libraries. It's just amazing. So I was curious what you'd seen in terms of you know, getting people, getting the developers first-hand contact. And John, before you actually answer this, let me just say for all of you who just came in, which is from across the street, are you all knowledge uh, track, knowledge sharing track people? Okay, so what we did, short of you being here, um, was sort of take some of the themes that we had discussed in the innovation track, one of which, as you can undoubtedly see, was user-centric processes involving your users. And user sounds really horrible, but um, your constituencies, really, um, in the design and the conceptual processes, as well as in the, now we're going into the, okay, how do we transfer knowledge? In other words, how do we, and there was a maker, the maker theme, it's, it's resonating with me, but um, how do we start b building local cultures of hackers, makers, whatever, that actually take this further than, and do it in, a con in their own context and with their own skill and their own local knowledge, latent knowledge, inherent knowledge that we wouldn't even know about in the first place. So we'll take this theme a little further, and then who is the rapporteur from the other group? Is there one? I don't know who you are. Apparently not. All right, so I'm going to call on some of you to tell us what you did over on the other side of the street and, and uh, some key themes that you identified. Uh, yeah, real quickly, I can discuss this further in detail outside if anybody wants to, but um, we, we follow a similar model to what you're doing over at Instead, which is rotate our developers in. They're pair programming with local developers in country. And by far, any methodology we've applied, we've you know, have probably 10 different programmatic methodologies we've put in place over the last four years. Um, it always comes down to a bandwidth issue. Uh, when our developers are there, they can't download the updates. When their developers are there, they can't look up the documents they need. It's a huge, huge problem for pair programming, for building local talent, local capacity on the ground, that they don't have enough internet access to access the resources that people in developed countries have, because programmers in particular are very good at looking stuff up. It saves them a ton of time. They can ask questions of user group, news groups, find resources online. And when you take that away from people to be able to leverage in country, it's, it's a massive handicap. I can't fathom having to learn how to program um, without the, the broadband capabilities we have in, in developed country universities. It's just such a, a mind-boggling handicap to have to deal with. You have funny shifts. You can program at 3 o'clock in the morning when there's a little bit of bandwidth. Um, Hi, um, my name is Cliff Schmidt from Literacy Bridge, and it's um, great to hear the same kind of stories. Just last month, um, uh, we took uh, this device that we developed. It's just used for local creation of information in, in an audio form. An individual or an organization records some information about health or agriculture, and Can they make it available to people. Yeah, it's okay, just a little $5 device, um, 5 to $10 or so. Now, what we did was, um, and actually it's funny, MIT students keep coming up. We took two MIT interns out with us last month. I don't know how they've become so popular. And, uh, and we thought we had the right design from working with the Ghana government's regional, um, central, regional, and district level about what we were going to design. And we had it really focused around, because this, this stores 40 hours of audio on it, you need to be able to categorize these things and find them easily. So we found everything was very centered around the finding of the information. And to do that, every audio uh, message had a title. Um, you could tag it with various categories. Um, it would pl you'd, to make sure it was right when it was recorded, you'd play back and make sure it was confirmed and go through that. What we learned was that 
there was so much interest from everyone around creating recordings and that that process was a little too difficult because we were trying to make it so easy for the listening part. So we ended up actually reprogramming the whole device in the field um, by getting on a bicycle and driving out to get some diesel fuel to power the generator to run the laptop a little bit longer. And, uh, and what we did was we made it so you push one button, it records right away. You don't ask for a title because that just took one more step and there, people would sometimes get confused between the title and the message. Uh, you wouldn't ask, do you want to confirm, do you want to keep this recording or not, because sometimes people would misunderstand and you'd lose the whole recording. So that was just a really valuable process for right there with the users and seeing how we had actually screwed up the focus of it and had to change it right there. So what would you have done differently? Oh, um, well, I think as far as process-wise, yeah. I, I don't know what we could have done differently um, because getting out in the field and being ready to make those adjustments turned out to be the right thing. Um, as far as, uh, as you know, the design for the specific thing, it was just that we didn't realize how strong the interest was for individual creation of audio content and how, how much that would override just the, I want it to be nice and organized when some other organization like the district health office gives you some information. So David, David, Galloper, you are David. So you want to give us a little bit of a sense? Here are the people in the innovation uh, track, what you all did over on the other side of the street. Key themes, give me two key themes and two takeaways. How's that? <laughs> or something, something on my own? Come on. Well, basically on that side, uh, from the open content track, what we try to do is separate technology from content. And in, in the essence, OK. In, in, the, in the essence, um, there is the content and there's a way to deliver the content, basically, in the end. And the content, I mean, I, I've heard the discussion now with HDTV over here. You can have the best TV with so many pixels on it, but it's still crap TV. Um, and it's the same thing that uh, content has to become very, very important as part of the communication themes. And even on technology, when I hear about innovation, a lot of stuff, a lot of it's not around innovation and technology. A lot of it's around training and getting people to understand how to code and work from that way. And, and you know, innovation isn't what you create. It's what you do in the end. And so we tried to look at the granularities. We brought, brought it down for the first segment strictly on words, the second segment on tools. So what do we do with those words, and how do we get the words out there? And then the third segment is really around um, comprising a strategy. Where does web fit into a communication strategy, and what is a communication strategy nowadays, and how do you work your channels? Uh, let's work it that way. So that's basically what we were doing on that side. A lot of good speakers, uh, a lot of case studies. Um, we wrapped it up with a case study, I guess, uh, from the Obama, BarackObama.com, and how they ran the campaign. So we had the outreach person, the head of outreach, and how they ran the campaign and all the different tools and different channels that they used to get their message across. So that's basically what we talked about. The take, the take, uh, take home out of it is it really from a UN perspective, and I'll put the disclaimer, I, I'm private sector before, I've been UN now for about four or five years or something like that. Um, there isn't, especially at the web level, there's not a whole bunch of respect that the UN gives web people. They don't have a lot of funding, they don't have a lot of money, they don't have decision making power. Uh, a lot of it just gets pushed down, you get a bunch, put it up, put it up, put it up. So who's making the decision on who's running the communications online is usually and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but it's usually, you know, usually someone from a division or department level that's saying, put it up, put it up, put it up, whether it's important or not. So we had a lot of discussion around how to communicate online and how to communicate in general and what is important around communicating, key messages, uh, opinion leaders, how to work, how to network, how to work all the different channels. And I think that's an important part that we brought over there that to, and the real mission of open content track was to empower and motivate the people in the audience so they have some tools and some vocabulary to go back to their senior managers and say, listen, this is how we can do it. And it's not going to cost a lot of funds. I need some skill changes, but it's not going to cost a lot of funds. It's not going to cost, let's just give it a try. Let's give it a whack. Let's experiment with this. Because in the end, all we're doing is experiment. There, there's no textbook. We're, not, you know, we're writing the textbook on this as we go along. And the UN, quite honestly, in my opinion, they should be leading on writing that textbook because we deal with the developing nations. And developing nations, because they're leapfrogging because of their own creativity and their own interpretation of what we're supposedly telling them what to do, um, they are going to be further ahead from developing nations. And I think everyone can agree with that. We see that with mobile. 
uh, they've leapfrogged well ahead of Europe, which is slightly ahead of uh, North America. Um, because of the standards, basically. So this was a lot of the conversation. And in the end, I think people did have something that they can go home with, either through the presentation or through the dialogue, and say that we can apply these types of techniques with these plays, a channel, this methodology to what we do here, give them the vocabulary that they can present it in a strategic form to their senior managers, and the senior managers can buy into it. And I think that's the start of how this is all. And that is innovation. <laughs>